Okay. Ah. Olá a todos e a todas. É, enquanto presidente da Associação de Linguística e Filologia da América Latina, o FAO, aproveito a oportunidade para, para, para parabenizar a Abralim na pessoa do professor Miguel Oliveira pela brilhante iniciativa. Tenho acompanhado algumas atividades do Abralim ao vivo e vejo o quanto elas são importantes nesse momento de confinamento e quanto serão depois que isso acabar pois, como ficarão disponibilizadas as apresentações, elas poderão servir como material para discussão nas futuras aulas presenciais. Sei que é um grande desafio para Miguel e para todos que estão trabalhando nessa, nesse projeto, mas sabemos que só desafiando as dificuldades é que conseguimos alguma coisa. Quero aproveitar também a oportunidade para expressar a minha solidariedade a todos que têm sofrido com os danos provocados pelo Covid-19, nos países que mais perdas tiveram e também naqueles que estão conseguindo minimizar os efeitos da pandemia. E expressar, aproveito para expressar a minha revolta pelo que está acontecendo no Brasil, com um presidente que tem a coragem de tratar o momento de forma tão desdenhosa, achando que não existe vida sem economia. E o pior preocupando-se mais com sua estabilidade política do que com a busca de soluções para minimizar a situação. É, agora, eu gostaria de falar algumas, passar algumas informações acerca da UFAO, a, a associação que eu estou presidindo. A ideia da fundação da UFAO ocorreu em agosto de 1962, em Cambridge, Massachusetts, durante o nono Congresso Internacional de Linguística, organizado pelo Comitê Internacional Permanente de Linguistas, que também é um... É, é, o comitê também faz parte dessa iniciativa. E, naquela época, um grupo de linguistas é, hispanistas, latino-americanos e de outras proveniências, eles tomaram essa iniciativa de criar o FAO, e a efetivação da associação aconteceu em Vinha del Mar, no Chile, numa reunião realizada de 20 a 25 de janeiro de 1964, sob os auspícios do Instituto de Filologia da Universidade do Chile. Os projetos de pesquisa, de pesquisa eles são o núcleo da UFAO, integrados por especialistas que se reúnem voluntariamente eles organizam uma agenda de pesquisa cujos resultados são apresentados nos congressos internacionais. No momento, a UFAO conta com 28 projetos, sendo alguns deles voltados especificamente para o espanhol, outros voltados para o português, outros voltados para as línguas indígenas e outros que reúnem essas três possibilidades. Semana passada, tivemos aqui na, no, no Abralinha ao Vivo a realização da mesa de dialectologia, coordenada pela professora Jacira Mota, uma das coordenadoras do projeto Atlas Linguístico do Brasil, ao lado da professora Vandessiva Aguilera, que é um projeto da UFAO. E hoje teremos duas conferências, uma do professor Francisco Ordonez, um dos coordenadores do projeto România Nova, ao lado da professora Sandra Quaresmin e do professor André Saab. Eu gostaria de registrar aqui, nesse momento, a participação neste projeto da professora Mericato, que tanto contribuiu, mas que saiu da coordenação. A outra conferência, mais tarde, será do professor Rainer Henrique Hamel, da Universidade Autônoma do México, que é o coordenador do projeto Políticas Linguísticas Todos esses são projetos da UFAO. Ontem tivemos a fala do professor Paulo Osório, que participa também do projeto de, é, para a história, a história do português do Brasil. A UFAO tem representação em todos os continentes, contando com delegações que são responsáveis por congregar membros que queiram participar das discussões durante os congressos. Para se tornar membro da UFAO, é só ato com o delegado de seu país cujo endereço pode ser encontrado no site www.mundoalfal.org. A cada três anos, 
A UFAO realiza um congresso internacional de caráter itinerante, o último foi em Bogotá, em 2017, e o seguinte deveria acontecer agora, em agosto, em 2020, na Universidade de La Paz, mas que teve que alterar a sua data por conta do, é, é, da pandemia que estamos vivendo. E sobre a, questão, a realização desse evento em La Paz, a, eu, nós percebemos que há um receio por parte de algumas pessoas de participar por conta da altura da cidade. Né? Eu tive a oportunidade de visitar La Paz o ano passado né, para conhecer a instituição. E eu não tive nenhum problema de saúde, vejo que eu, tenho, eu sou hipertenso, mas eu consegui passar uma semana lá sem nenhum problema. Estou dizendo isso para incentivar as pessoas, elas devem ir a La Paz, eu acho que é importante, é uma cidade belíssima que vale a pena ser conhecida. Né? E vamos torcer para que o Covid-19 nos permita realizar o Congresso em 2021, no período de 9 a 13 de agosto. E, a propósito disso, a partir de agosto desse ano, vamos divulgar um novo período para inscrições para aqueles que não fizeram no primeiro momento, não é? quando o evento foi pensado para 2020. Durante o Congresso, além das, das sessões voltadas para os projetos, temos também a possibilidade de apresentação de trabalho em sessões de comunicações que não se circunscrevem às áreas dos projetos da UFAO. Além do Congresso Internacional, a cada três anos temos as realizações dos alfalitos, que são eventos propostos, em geral, por delegados ou por coordenadores dos projetos. A UFAO conta com duas publicações. A UFAO tem a Revista Linguística e o Quadernos de Linguística. Quem quiser acessar e saber informações sobre como enviar trabalhos para publicações, nesses periódicos pode também consultar o site www.mundoalfal.org. Um dos maiores desafios da Alfal é possibilitar discussões que busquem interagir, estudos das diferentes línguas existentes na América Latina. E é com isso em mente que temos trabalhado em nossa gestão. Fiquem bem e se cuidem. Obrigado. Um, good morning. My name is Sonia Cirino, and I'm a and I am a professor at uh, the Department of Linguistics at the University of Campinas, Unicamp. And I am very very happy to present our guest today, Dr. Francisco Ordonez. First, I'd like to thank everybody who is watching this live today, this event. A Baralinha ao Vivo Linguistics Online, as you know, is an initiative brought to you by Abralim, Associação Brasileira de Linguística, in cooperation with several international associations, among which are Permanent International Committee of Linguists, Associação de Linguística e Filologia de América Latina, ALFAO, Sociedade Argentina de Estudios Linguísticos, Association Interna Associação Internacional de Linguística Aplique, Linguistic Society of America, Societas Linguística Europea, and the Linguistics Association of Great Britain. The event is designed to give students and researchers free access to state-of-the-art dis discussions on the most diverse topics related to the study of human language during this difficult time of quarantine. I would like to remind you about the importance of being a member of Abralim, as you can thus contribute to the promotion of these scientific meetings, courses, and publications. Now, let me say a few words about our guest today. Professor Francisco Ordonis is a very well-known scholar. He is an associate professor at the Department of Linguistics at Stony Brook University, New York, 
and his research is focused on the study of formal linguistics. His specialization has been uh, the comparative study of the syntax of Spanish, its varieties, and other Romance languages such as Catalan, French, Italian, and Occitan dialects. The focus of his investigation has been on clitics, word order, differential object marking, realization of subjects, and his present research involves the study of the synthetic differences of the dialects of Spanish, Spanish spoken in Latin America and Spain. He has extensively published on all these topics. He has also collaborated with several linguists over the years. Laurie Repetti, Stella Trevino, Judy Bernstein, Frances Groca, among others. Additionally, he is the co-founder with Mary Cato of the University of Campinas of Romania Nova, a project that is part of Alfau. I first met Professor Francisco Ordoines exactly in the context of the project back in 2005 when it was launched in Monterrey, Mexico. The project aims to compare Romance languages in Europe with those in Latin America and eventually compare the Romance varieties in Latin America among themselves by using the common theoretical tools launched by the principles and parameters theory proposed by Chomsky in 1981. One fundamental question in the principles and parameters perspective is to what extent the languages being compared are similar and or different. As one of the results of the Romania Nova project, he edited, together with Mary Cato, the book, The Morphosyntax of Portuguese and Spanish in Latin America, an invaluable collection of papers bringing, stu bringing studies on the morphology, syntax, variation, and change in the languages of the old and new Romania, or the old and new Romania, from a generative and comparative perspective. Given that the goal of comparative syntax is to understand the patterns of variation and micro variation found in natural languages, as this is fundamental to understand our language faculty, Professor Ordonis' work thus brings a most relevant contribution to the field. So today I'm very privileged to present his talk on microparameters in Romance languages in Europe and the Americas. He's going to talk about topics, subjects, and proper nouns. And I'd like to thank Professor Ordoines for having accepted Abraham's invitation to give this talk. And now I leave the floor to him. Welcome and thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Miguel Oliveira. And thank you, Dermeval, for inviting me to this, uh, um, to this talk, a uh, virtual talk. And so I thank Alfal, I thank mostly Abraline, and I thank you for, for inviting me and have a chance to talk uh, about my recent work um, that is very relevant for um, uh, Alfal, which is a, uh, uh, is the study of linguistics in the Latin America, um, and I also want to to send my solidarity with Brazilian uh, with Brazil, given the very difficult situation that is going through with the cor coronavirus there, and um, hopefully this pandemic will be over soon everywhere. But in the meantime. We have to do things this way. Um, so I'll be sharing my screen uh, from now on, so you won't see me until the question period. 
and uh, and uh, so uh, I'll be doing that now. Okay. I hope everybody can see. Okay, it's past. Everybody sees, right? Okay. Uh, so this is a work that I'm just a uh, general introduction. I will do a general introduction to, um, let me, a general introduction to, um, uh, okay, slide show, okay, second slide. So this is a general introduction to, to the work that I'm doing and in collaboration in particular, as Professor de Merval mentioned with uh, Mary Cato, who, she was one of the co-founders of uh, Romania Nova, and now she's retired. And then another other work that I'm doing with a uh, university professor at William Patterson College and uh, Frances Roca, who is professor at the University of Girona. And we'll be talking about different Romance languages, Catalan, Spanish, and Brazilian Portuguese, and um, English, well, English is not a Romance language, but you know, I will take it as a reference to what, what I'm doing. So uh, in the, in, I will do an introduction of the general uh, trends of the kinds of things that I'm doing in, in syntax and why I'm doing them. And then I will give you two sample studies of that work, which is uh, topic subjects in Brazilian and Portuguese. For those who are not familiar with that construction, Brazilian syntax editions, we all know them very well. You, well, I'll have something more, to, or we have something more to contribute to that. And the second part will be talking about the syntax of proper nouns, and particularly the fact that in some Romance languages, uh, proper nouns might, might be used with a determiner. And then finally, I'll go to the conclusions. So for the general introduction, we'll talk about comparative syntax and microparameters. Let me introduce this general overview. So uh, comparative linguistics, not syntax, comparative linguistic has a very long trajectory, probably as long as the field itself. And the comparative method was very crucial during the 19th century in order to unveil common ancestor of the European languages, like the 19th century particularly with neogrammarians. And the method basically consisted in looking at different languages and comparing their phonological, morphological, and syntactic properties. And that method has been uh, very fruitful. The, the guiding principles that, we, that were used in these uh, early stages, well, in the 19th century in comparative historical linguistics were two, I think, I'm just, you know, glossing, I mean, summarizing in general ways. So one of them was that linguistics must find clear correspondences between the, the languages that we are studying, okay? And the second guiding principle is that we have to use our theoretical tools or knowledge of the theory of what we think is going on in, in linguistics in order to make sense of those correspondence. To finding correspondence is not sufficient. You have to have some guiding theoretical tools that tells you how to connect the dots. Otherwise, you just find uh, you just find correspondence without making any uh, sense about them. So these are the two guiding principles. Now let's move to modern comparative syntacticians. So for, this was the 19th century, which I thought was a very important uh, milestone in the history of linguistics. And then we go to modern comparative syntacticians. And in particularly, I am part of the generative tradition. And they, we basically follow the same guiding principle, but their, their objectives are broader. Obviously after the Chomsky revolution, we are taking this, 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 this uh, uh, the, we're trying to find out what is, in, what is the language faculty and how it works. And obviously uh, it's more abstract as the theory has been evolving and more discovered theoretical claims and generalizations are found, then we have to make sense of this comparison based on what we have discovered. In, and the, the number of discoveries have been going, growing very rapidly over the years. Um, that's why we call it the Chomsky revolution. Um, uh, so the guiding principles are the same. We find correspondences between languages, and linguists use the theoretical tools to make sense of those correspondences as we go along. That's basically, so that has not changed. The context has 
changed a lot since the 19th century. So one basic question is why do we wanna do comparative syntax? Well, I think that we have to do comparative syntax in order to unveil the mechanism that underline human syntax. We know for sure that variation is not random, that variation follows certain patterns. And we have to unveil what those patterns of variation in syntax are. That's not an easy task. The second task is that by comparing language, we also will figure out what is exactly universal. Um, by seeing what is different, we also find what is not different, obviously. That's um, in generative grammar, as it started in the 50s, really it, the comparative method doesn't take off until uh, the principles and parameter theory. And it starts to play a more of a crucial role in generative syntax. Parameters with the introduction of the notion of parameters in Chomsky 1981. So parameters, and they, the original idea of parameters is whether there are parameters, there are principles, by contrary to other universal principles, these are principles are subject to a choice. That's the idea behind Chomsky 1981, okay? And so we, we for, for the first time, um, look at principles and parameters. It's in uh, the principles and parameters in the theory brought various things into play. One of them is that in the generative uh, uh, framework, um, principles and parameters was able to capture syntactic variability in generative sound grammar, which, uh, Syntactic variability was more of a mystery or was not an interest in generative grammar. I think the principles and parameter theory brought that as a point important to be, um, to be focused. Second, it launched a new era in which more languages and varieties of languages are studied and compared. So it was an explosion of people looking at different of romance languages, looking at Chinese, looking at many other groups of languages. And it was so transformative that time that it became hard to do syntax without comparison and attending the question of syntactic variation. You just have to look at the publication before the 1980s in generative syntax and the publications after, and you, you will find. So you have books like French syntax, which only looked at French. And that was no point of comparison of French syntax in, by Richard King with, for instance, English syntax. Oh, there was a book on English syntax. So that changed. I mean, the change occurred gradually right at the end of the 1970s, to tell you the truth. I mean, I'm just saying that Chomsky wrote that, uh, the definition of parameter in the 80s, but the change already was occurring in the 80s. Now, I'm not gonna debate about the question of the parameters now today, because um, that would take the whole talk, but I just wanna mention that the status of parameter has evolved through the theory, obviously, as all the concepts, they have to change as we make discoveries and we know more things. I mean, the way in which we uh, parameters were conceived at the end of the 70s, obviously, is not the same way. I mean, as when we were starting, it's not the same way as we conceive them uh, now. And there are obviously, as in any scientific field, there are discussions, argument, arguments, and, um, and debates about how is the best way to put, where, how to define um, parameters. They used to, parameters in the, Early stages were completely explicitly stated as part of universal grammar, the part which is uh, uh, UG. But in recent years, there is a debate as how much of the parameter is part of UG and how much is due to other linguistic factors. So there is a big how much, how much is is there that is part of, of only the language of faculty and how much is in, how they are interacting with other. Um, other uh, other uh, linguistic uh, external well, other things like externalization. I'm not going to dwell on that. I, I just want to say that uh, one of the views is that parameters should be only located as lexical properties. That's one view, and which is not shared by everybody. And I think it's very good that we're having these debates now because, after all, this is what science is about. Um, for an interesting. Um, for an interesting study of uh, this debate, uh, I would I would I put here a, a recent discussion that occurred two weeks ago 
by Pino Longobardi and Ian Roberts on the status of parameters and how much how much of them should be placed in, as part of the UG. So if, if this is recorded, you will have here the, the YouTube and I, I encourage you to watch that. Very interesting debate. There are two debates, but this is one, this is the first, the one about um, parameters and UG. Okay, so we're changing, uh, so what is, since I'm doing comparative syntax and I'm doing uh, microparametric, I'm doing the uh, principles and parameters, Kane introduces the notion of macroparametric syntax or microparameters, micro minor parameters. So what is microparametric syntax inside the study of parameters? Is the, is the comparative work uh, of syntax done in a set of very closely related languages or dialects. So microparametric, just look at things that are close by. And of course, we have to define what is close by. I mean, in terms of how is syntactically adjacent or syntactically similar, this kind of thing. Why do we wanna do comparative micro, microparametric syntax? It, in order to find out which syntactic properties correlate between languages, variables must be kept to a manageable, a manageable number. This means we must compare languages, or varieties of languages with many common properties to keep difference to a minimum. Basically, this, it's a method of doing uh, uh, comparative work based on the idea that you want to, in order to isolate where the correlation works, you just keep all variables to a minimum. So you have to compare things that have uh, similar syntactic properties. Obviously, the, you know that doesn't that doesn't exclude another other methods of doing comparative syntax, which is um, what uh, Baker have called macroparametric syntax, which you compare totally different languages that hardly have anything in common. It's just a way um, of doing comparative work at a at a level where you know that you are keeping things very similar to, and only the difference are reduced uh, to a minimum. Okay, this is, this is a, and by doing this work, and which I, this is what I've been doing all these years, um, we try to find out, well, how we always try to put our grain off, uh, grain off, or add to the knowledge of the theory, obviously, or, 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 or or target is to get to what is this telling us about uh, human languages in general. And I will give you here two examples. The first one is the topic subject construction in Brazilian and Portuguese. This is work that just came out in syntax and it's joint work with um, Mary Cato, who was a co-founder of Romania Nova, and now she's retired. And uh, the second work was the syntax of proper names in Catalan and Spanish. And I will, there are many of the things here are also occur in Brazilian Portuguese. So let's see. Uh, and the question period of how things go. As uh, Dermeval mentioned, this is part of Romania Nova, uh, which is a Romance languages in the America. And that uh, we have compared Romance varieties with each other and with other languages that are in contact with, in the Americas. So where we compare mostly Spanish, Portuguese. We have had talks on Quebecois French too, and other Creoles, but here is our website if you're interested in the project. And here are my co-organizers of the, of, the, of the project. Santa Cuarezamin, which just joined us last year from Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina, and Andres Saab from Conicet and Universidad de Buenos Aires. And we continue there and we, we have done many, um, I think that a lot of like 10, uh, 10 we organized 10 conference and um, we will organize more in Brazil, in Argentina, in Mexico. And the last one was here in New York. Um, so let me talk to the first topic to illustrate um, uh, how we do uh, microparametric syntax. And I will illustrate with two specific examples. Um, one of them is going to be uh, the so-called topic subject constructions in Brazilian Portuguese. So what are the topic subject constructions in Brazilian Portuguese? 
So here you have it in example 1A and B. So in Brazilian Portuguese, you say things that have been, this construction have attracted the attention of a lot of linguists in the Brazil, in Brazilian syntax. As you can see from some of the reference, I don't think it's complete, but you know, I pointed out some of, some of the most, some names there that have worked on. And this construction is the Brazilian Portuguese, contrary to other Romance languages, makes it so that something that would be considered a topic in, um, in the, in the beginning of a clause agrees with a verb. And for instance, you have something that for other Romance language would be uncomprehensible. So you would say something like these forests rained a lot, meaning in other Romance languages and in these forests rained a lot. And you have an agreement of the topic, these forests with rain, okay? With the third person plural because the forests are plural. Uh, in other Romance languages, it would be expressed with a topic like in these florists and there would be no agreement. Another example is found in B1B, uh, my teams lack luck, don't get fooled by the English translation. If you look at the Spanish and other Romance language of the verb faltar, you would express that sentence in Spanish with the say, to my teams lack uh, luck. luck. Okay. Uh, but in Brazilian Portuguese, you can have an agreement with what would say in Spanish to my team, a mi equipo, with the verb faltar. So you say, mis equipos faltan suerte. So this is a very curious construction that is found in Brazilian Portuguese. And I, as I said, it, because of that, it has attracted a lot, uh, a lot of attention. It, ha it, happen it happens with certain location verbs, like uh, so, some with verbs like weather verbs. We had it with this uh, verb like faltar, which is an accusative. And um, you find it also with certain an accusative too, with uh, where you have a possession relationship. So you have a sentence like to, an, to a like uh, verse, the title of Hamilton, the, the title of Hamilton verse, where you have a sentence like verse, which was an accusative. And then you have the tire of Hamilton, Hamilton being the possessor. Um, you might have a possessor Hamilton to become the subject of a sentence, which is the topic subject construction would be to be, or Hamilton food open air. The Hamilton burst the tire. It doesn't mean that Hamilton is a causer of the bursting, but in Brazilian Portuguese, it means that the, to Hamilton, it's the, um, the, the dative, what we would express as a dative in Spanish is, 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 a, is a, in this case, not the beneficiary, but the, the dative, to, bar, to Hamilton burst the tire. And it, it, it agrees with the subject. You don't say in the singular, but if I had it in plural, you would say, os Hamilton furarum open air. So you have uh, this agreement. So this is the, the, this is the construction. The topic subjects, one of the properties that they have is that they occur with an accusative verbs and with weather verbs. So they verbs that do not have any um, initial thematic position for subjects. So it does not occur with transitives. So if you have a sentence like the boy ate the oranges, you just cannot take the topicalize the oranges and then make it to agree with the verb and then the subject will be put post verbally. So you couldn't say the oranges ate the boy is in the sense that we mean that the boy ate the oranges is impossible there. So topic subject constructions have a requirement with respect to that they have to be certain intransitive verbs that do not assign thematic roles. And one of the salient properties of this construction is that they alternate with an empty expletive. So empty expletives are possible in Brazilian Portuguese. So usually you have the alternation. So you have rain a lot in these forests with the locative in in, and then you have these forests uh, rain third person pool a lot. Uh, these constructions have led early in the generative uh, tradition to think that um, Brazilian Portuguese is a topic prominent language. So there was a, here we are going to a, what we would call macro parameters. So they would, then in the famous studies by Lee and Thompson, there would be the languages that do have subject agreements, which is most of the European languages. And then there would be also languages that instead of agreeing with the subjects, they will agree with the preverbal topics. That's the a macro parameter. So that's what led to this uh, study. 
And importantly, uh, why do we have this uh, construction? How, what, what is, is it due to? And in generally, in the generative tradition, the appearance of such construction has been linked to the changes in the null subject parameters in Brazilian Portuguese. And this, has, this is a, a also a very important, um, important uh, uh, there has been a lot of work done on this topic in Brazilian Portuguese. So we know that Brazilian Portuguese contrary to Brazilian Portuguese or European Spanish or any other Romance languages, that their properties uh, of uh, licensing uh, empty subjects and all subjects have changed, uh, I mean, have, have, uh, have evolved in such a way that it's not a robust null subject language in the sense that because there are changes, there have been changes in the paradigm of the verbal paradigm, particularly the uh, first person plural uh, and the fact that the second person, the second person uses the same inflection as the third person have made it a, a more impoverished uh, paradigm in, in verbal inflection, have translated into the fact that subjects are more uh, are more often used explicitly in Brazilian Portuguese than they are in other Romance languages. In some people have also claimed that Brazilian Portuguese is a, a partial null subject language. So the, the appearance of those construction has been linked to the fact that Brazilian Portuguese over the years have lost these properties as a null subject language. It's not entirely lost because we saw that we have empty expletives, so it's not like English. But it's definitely, you have to have the subject more explicit more often. And I'm not gonna get into details because that would take the whole hour. Uh, Brazilian Portuguese is definitely not a robust null subject language. And that has to be um, taken into account in, to find out why we have these topic subject construction. Here I'm gonna take uh, the, the one of hypothesis and uh, that tries to, uh, that in, uh, tries to, uh, account for why the connection there is between null subjects, the loss of null subjects. It's not like English, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's, 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 it's not as robust as uh, Spanish or uh, standard uh, European Spanish or Italian. And Nunes uh, indicates that these constructions are permitted in Brazilian Portuguese because tense, uh, because it's, it's lost in some of its uh, strength, uh, it becomes non-selective. So it's allowing things that are not subject like elements or they are like, uh, they could just come up there. The fact that it's weakened in somehow allows these things to come up there and, and occupy the position of the subject, okay? And he, uh, uh, Nunes 2018, I mean, I'm just, you know, glossing over all the technical details that, that I, uh, links and uh, links it uh, very um, um, nicely links these to other properties that Brazilian Portuguese has with respect to other properties like um, which distinguish it to other Romance languages like the fact that you have this a non-selective T could be linked to the fact that in Brazilian Portuguese you have what is being called hyper raising constructions. So hyper raising constructions are the verb raising verb seem when appears with an embedded uh, clause, with a uh, final clause with a complementizer, the subject of embedded clause um, in a complement, uh, which has a complementizer, seems to raise up to the higher projection. So in Brazilian Portuguese, you say, no parece que elas são brasileiras. And uh, if you can take the elas, the not seem that they be Brazilian, if you take the elas up, you say elas, now parecen que son brasileiras. Ellas no parecen que son brasileiras, which is, uh, and so they, he, he links the two things. I mean, they're not, so a lot of it is said because, you know, we have in a more weakened sort of uh, tense because it's shown by the last of null subjects, not completely, but partial null subjects or whatever, then you have to have that. So there are two conditions for topic subject, which seems to be correct. One of them is that te, the tense, which is responsible for null subject is non-selective, which is tied to the loss of the null subjects, not completely lost, but partially lost. And then the second condition for having topic null subject is only happening with verbs um, that uh, 
that do not assign thematic role to the subject. And this uh, is also um, been uh, looked in a paper by uh, Andrade um, and um, others. This includes transitive and energetic verbs. Um, okay, so our contribution to this is the following. And this is on an insight by Mary Cato, which is one of the problems, one of the problems, not there are no problems with the previous hypothesis, but I'm, one of the things that have been looked overlooked over the, the studies before is the fact that Brazilian Portuguese not only uh, underwent changes in um, the, um, it's not only difference with respect to the distribution of null subjects or it's an impoverished null subject language. It also is, a, I, I don't like the word impoverished, but it's a, it has less, uh, it, it also has to do with the fact that the, there is a language that also has um, less clitics, which is a topic that I work on, uh, than other Romance languages. Let me say this. Clitics, you know, these are these things that appear next to the verb in Romance languages that are phonologically deficient. And one of the things that ha has happened in Brazilian Portuguese, and I'm talking about colloquial spoken Brazilian Portuguese, is that it has entirely lost third person clitics. And to be more exact, it has lost third person proclitics. So, uh, sentences in which um, you have a third person proclitic before the verb, it's in, in, it's, it's, it's in colloquial um, Brazilian Portuguese do not occur. Though, however, that doesn't mean that the Brazilian Portuguese has not lost all clitics because the first and second person clitics are very robust. So 5A, o, o João me adora, it's perfectly, te adora, first and second person. But if you move to third person, there is a quite a difference. O João o a adora, it's not colloquial Brazilian Portuguese. In Brazilian Portuguese, for that, you would have to say, or use, as Sonia has worked a lot in her, in her work on null, sub, on null objects, you would say, o João adora, or you would have to express with an upper pronoun, but the, hardly an existence of third person. These are, so the, the disappearance of third person clitics in, in colloquial spoken Bra Brazilian Portuguese, which is what we are interested in, um, has also, uh, the insight is that he also contributes to the appearance of the uh, uh, topic subject construction. And with third person clitics, here I'm expressing the third person critic object, uh, uh, direct object, but this also applies to indirect objects, which would be ye, which is not hardly, nobody, uh, well, it's, it's not in colloquial version for this. So, so now I, uh, Jairo and many others, not only Jairo, but many others have made the connection between topic subjects and, and the lack of null subjects or link to it. Modesto, Naves, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, it's in the bibliography. Um, uh, the, we, we are, we are, our contribution is to show, well, also, you know, clinics, the last, the fact that we don't have third person clinics needs to be taken into account for why this construction occurred. And there are three considerations to, um, to take into account the loss of third person clinics as an important factor in these changes. The first, the first change, the first thing that it tells us that clinics play a role is there is an asymmetry between topic subjects, which as you've probably noticed until now have used uh, topic subjects for third person. But in the moment you move to first and second person, things are not, when you already have a clitic available, then the fact that you have the clitic available with first and second person makes the topic subject constructions bad or degraded compared to the clitic left dislocation. So if you say to me like, lock, you basically, in the first sentence, to me, like lock, you're basically doing the same as you would do in Spanish. And you don't use the topic subject construction, which would say the one that you see in an asterisk, like I like lock. So, eu faltei sorte versus para mim me faltou sorte. So there is, what I want to express is there is an asymmetry between 
uh, a topic subject with first and second and versus third person that needs to be taken care of. And only focusing on the last of null subject is not going to tell us why there is some asymmetries in this respect. Uh, this is another example with Bosse, with Te, para Bosse, Falto Sorci. You have the clinic, then find topic subject construction. Mm -mm. Okay. So, um, so this is the first consideration. We need to take into account that topic subjects are not as readily available with first and second person because probably that's what we want to say because first and second person, you already have a clinic and third person, you don't. The second one is of a historical dimension. The historical dimension means that as um, a historical linguistics is very good at, at trying to test hypotheses as well, you know, because if things evolve, these things have changed because there has some changes in, in the syntax before and now. And the historical argument due to Cato 1993 is that it's true that at least European written Portuguese in the 18th century did have third person politics more available than it does now, spoken Brazilian Portuguese. So we expect that in the history of Brazilian Portuguese, they had more clinics before than now, that the topics, subject constructions start emerge, not only as Brazilian Portuguese loses its properties as a null, uh, completely strong null subject language, become a weak null subject language, but also when the language starts to lose third person clinics. And this is that historical argument. And the third one where I want to focus more is the comparison, the comparative um, dimension. Because here I wanted to compare um, Brazilian Portuguese to another, other dialects or languages or um, varieties that do have some of the same syntactic properties as Brazilian Portuguese. Caribbean Spanish, and I mentioned Dominican Spanish as one example of Caribbean Spanish has also, contrary to non-Caribbean Spanish, has the property that it has, the, that has weakened its T in the sense that in a lot of work done by me and many others, Toribio, Camacho, we, we've seen that Dominican Spanish has been also like Brazilian Portuguese, um, the presence of overt subject or phonologically realized subjects is is, is more required than in other varieties of Spanish. But so it has this similarity between Bersinian and Portuguese. It's not exactly the same because obviously there are some differences, but uh, it, 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 it is, it's an interesting case study because we have lost of null subjects, not completely, but you know, when you, you, you use them more often. And what the origins of that seems to be that there is a similarity in between the two varieties with a heavy African influence in both cases. But it's, it's a minimal case study of what I would call a microparametric case, because if you compare Brazilian Portuguese with um, European Spanish, you would see, well, this is a, a total a null subject language like the European Spanish versus a language that is um, in the middle, like. Brazilian Spanish, but we are comparing Brazilian Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese with Dominican Spanish, which are both. They we know that they have different properties from the other varieties with respect to the null subject properties. So we could say that okay, Dominican Spanish might have a weakened tense also. Okay, but then when we go, so we hope, oh well, maybe Dominican Spanish or Caribbean Spanish might encounter uh, topic subject constructions because if only null subject is what explains that, and you might help to find this null topic, topic subject construction. The answer is no. Brazil, uh, top, uh, Dominican Spanish or Caribbean Spanish does not have these constructions. You can say, uh, los bosques llueven mucho, los equipos faltan suerte. And my favorite example, el reloj rompió las agujas, which doesn't mean that the clock broke. <laughs> the needles, but it means that to the clock broke the needles, which is what you would do in Brazilian Portuguese. You would say orologio quebrou as agulhas, which would mean something that to the clock broke the, the needles. So you don't have that in Brazilian. What you have is full-fledged uh, 
topicalization. A estos bosques les llueve mucho, a estos equipos les falta suerte, a este reloj se le rompió la aguja. So you have the sentences with, um, uh, okay. Uh, uh, you would have these sentences with the clitic. So, uh, so and this is another example with the clitic. So in, in Dominican and Spanish, you do have the clitics. And the difference, what is the difference between Dominican and Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese? Well, the, clit, the, the clear difference between Dominican and Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese is not in the null subject, but the fact that Dominican and Spanish has kept all its clitics. So this is a very interesting difference between Caribbean varieties and compared to, to, to uh, Brazilian Portuguese is that these Caribbean varieties have full have kept the third person clitics and have kept the third person in all varieties in accusative and in dated. So that's an interesting, I'm playing on this difference in the fact that Dominican Spanish and um, Brazilian Portuguese have, have um, have lost the, the Dominican Spanish have lost the third person, but and Brazilian Portuguese has lost. So, sorry, Brazilian Portuguese has lost third person, but Dominican Spanish has not. So that makes us think that the two, the, the way in which we derived uh, these locations, left these locations, and the way we derive topic subject construction must be certainly be very, very similar. So in order to make that um, clear, I here, I, put on a derivation uh, which contains Dominican, Spanish, and Brazilian Portuguese. So if you take a sentence like Falto lock to the, uh, lack lock to the teams, I would just assume that in both cases you have lo uh, lock of the teams. You have a possessor construction with lock of the teams. That's how you would introduce. So you have a possessor inside the lock, the possessed possessum, and the, the, on the teams would be the possessed thing. So you would start, with a big DP, this is taking basically the analysis by Landau on these constructions with natives. And then um, this, um, uh, or, or this example you saw below, like broke the needle to the, the clock. So you have the needle and the clock it would be a big processor construction. You would have the clock is the part of the, uh, 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 the, 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 the needle and then you have and the clock, which would be also um, part of this, this big DP of the needle of the clock. And then what in both languages, what I, we are gonna assume is that they move out of this DP because they're gonna be end up as topic subjects or at left dislocated elements. And we assume that there is an intermediate projection which we call dative because we know that in languages like Spanish, this is translated into dative. So, les faltó suerte, o uh, a la aguja se le, le rompió. Uh, el, uh, al reloj se le rompió la aguja. So, we assume that there is this movement to this dative uh, projection. And here, in the cases, this is an example for Dominican Spanish. A los equipos les faltó suerte, this dative, this projection dative is where the teams move, the processor, and it, that dative projection is lexicalized with a dative, clitic, less. Okay, and that's why you, you, because you have third person clitics, you lexicalize that projection. But what happens in Brazilian Portuguese, you don't have a third person clitic, you have nothing. You have an, an empty head, which is not lexicalized. So. And that's a crucial difference between Dominican Spanish and uh, Brazilian Portuguese. You have head, nothing, not lexicalized. But that there is something there um, because for other reasons that I'm not gonna go in detail that to assume that this element is behaving uh, as a dative in other respects. And so this is the initial point of our structure is to say these things move out and they move to these intermediate dative projections. And then uh, in the cases of when you have clitics, like in Brazilian Portuguese, first and second person, then you are able to move to that dative projection and then enter into, and then you lexicalize the dative head. So the dative head is lexicalized for first and second person, but not for third person in colloquial Brazilian Portuguese. So when you lexicalize the head, 
we are assuming that a data head has some case properties and it, 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 it legitimizes the, the data and it licenses the data in situ. And therefore, once the data is in situ because the data head is oplitic, then the only thing it can do is to move to a left peripheral position. It cannot go to a subject position because it has already been licensed in that data head. So it moves out and it moves to an uh, external position. As you can see in this construction, as in these trees, you see that paramin is move out and the spec TP, which is the, where the subject is, is occupied by an export. And this is, remember, these are constructions with the clitic, okay? But what happens, here's the crucial point, what happens when the clitic, that position is not lexicalized or doesn't have an overt clitic? We're assuming that that empty thing there, which in some previous approaches by Kato, and I think that and I like the idea a lot that what we got together on this is the idea that there might be an empty pleading here. I don't know that would be controversial, but that's the idea. There's an empty clinic, and this empty clinic, because you don't have a third person clinic, is not able to license these data in terms of case and agreement uh, in terms of case, which is a licensing condition. And therefore, because you don't do license that, then you have to move that thing to some place where it can license. And that in that respect, we are following uh, Nunes saying other people, which is assuming that that thing has to move to the spec TP because there in the spec TP is what is gonna move, is gonna be licensed. So basically this analysis, what is the introduction of this clitic head, which cannot license these, anything there is what is importantly to the emergence of uh, uh, subject clinics, uh, the topics clinics, the, no, the topic subjects in Brazilian Portuguese as opposed to other languages. So this is the connection that we're making. So we're not only introducing the question of null sub, the lack of the TP is non-selective, but also we're introducing the fact that, you know, you don't have third person clinics. So we're trying to put these things together. I think that's the novelty of this work. So in order to license topic subjects, there are three requirements. Have a defective T, Dominican and Spanish and Brazilian and Portuguese have that. Licensing of f t subjects, Dominican and Spanish to a certain extent and Brazil and Brazilian Portuguese to a certain extent also have that. And also fundamentally the lack of third person critics that license the DP in data phrase. Uh, the, sorry, that license, no, that they cannot license really. So the fact that you don't have a, a licensor for dative in third person is the really that. Uh, so, and that only Brazilian Portuguese has it, not Dominican Spanish. Dominican Spanish has not lost third person clitic. So here we have an exa clear example of why it's interesting to do microparametric. We have seen varieties that are closely related and we found exactly the, where the difference is. And the difference here is found on the fact that Brazilian Portuguese is losing its third person clitics, proclitics, sorry, proclitics. I'm not saying that they lose the third person and clitic ones, look, third person proclitics. And uh, Dominican Spanish has a robust uh, uh, system of third person clitics. So there's no problem there. No topic subjects in Dominican Spanish but topic subjects in Brazilian Portuguese. So that's a good example. I think it's a good example of the microparametric syntax. Uh, yeah, this is in order of time, and I wanna go to proper names, otherwise I'll be talking about this all the time. I just skip this. You can read it uh, in the recording. Um, yeah, well, some questions about that probably will come up in the question period about what, what, do I do? what do we do with logarithms? I'll wait for the question then. Uh, let me go to proper names then. Another area of, um, of interesting variability. Um, <clears throat> and this is work that I've been doing with Judy Bernstein and Frances Rocco in recent years. So from the verb, uh, I, I got into the DP syntax uh, with them. Uh, which they always, they have been working on it for a long time already. Uh, uh, so here the topic was this the following. Um, so proper names, um, proper names in languages that have determiners like English or like Italians, I'm leaving aside languages that have no determiners like Chinese or other, many or Russian. So languages that have determiners have the property where with proper names, you do not express the determiner. So you say John, you don't say the John. 
Or in Italian, standard Italian, you say Gianni, but you don't say Il Gianni. But we know that, you know, and that, that's, you know, that in some ways they say, well, that makes sense because why would you need a determiner if, you know, proper names are, you know, rigid designators, why would you need a determiner? But so happens that many languages do use something like a determiner. So one of them is another uh, one language that I'm also uh, work on and I'm a speaker of, which is Catalan. Catalan has, uh, uses uh, determiners with proper names. And uh, fundamentally, it, the interesting thing about Catalan is not only uses the, in some varieties of Catalan, the determiner is a special and only occurs with proper names. And for instance, in Anjuan to John, you use the un, which is a special determiner only used for proper names. And there is a very interesting history about what the origins of that article was. I'm gonna call that the personal article because it only occurs with proper names of person. It does not occur with proper names of rivers or anything. And in, uh, also you use the, the determiner with proper names like Maria, you say La Maria. And that's, uh, to my surprise, uh, was also found in Brazilian Portuguese in the South. So there's a difference between the South and Northeast with respect to this. So in Brazil, I was opaco with the determiner. O João, okay, Ameri. And this also found in uh, Greek, like in, it's uh, spread out in Greece or in Greek also. So you have two types of languages. So why, why is this variation? Is this telling us, is this uh, nothing much we can talk about it? The story about the use of the terminals with proper nouns, um, I think one of the most Im important advances that have been done on the syntax of proper nouns, I mean, in my opinion, is Longobardi 1994. Um, so the idea is the following. Um, proper nouns are intrinsically referential. And usually definite articles are contribute to the referential character of a noun. So why do you need a determiner for something that is already intrinsically referential? And moreover, um, how do you express, assuming the, the idea that all noun phrases are embedded in a DP, in a, a determiner phrase, then how is, is there a determiner phrase with a proper noun? Uh, that, that is there a position for the terminus in a proper noun? And Longobardi answer uh, inside the, the DP hypothesis, the, the terminal phrase hypothesis, saying the answer is yes. Uh, so in English and all these languages, there is a determiner phrase. And the reason why you don't express the determiner in these languages is because the proper noun has moved to the determiner position. So the reason why you don't say the John is because John has moved to the determiner and therefore has blocked the possibility of having a determiner there. And he links that movement to the fact that the, the, what gives referentiality to a noun is the, uh, the, the existence of a determiner head. So this is a full-fledged determiner. I mean, there's a controversy about determiner heads in recent years, but at back then you say, well, all everything that is a noun phrase with has plus the term, Referential must be a determiner her. If you don't hear it's because it's empty or because something has moved there and has occupied the position. If not, you have to express it with, a, with an empty determiner or with some determiner. So the analysis is found in languages with our article, Gianni has moved to the determiner head. So this is the famous N to D movement for proper names that would express the fact that, you know. So what happens in other languages? Well. Well, in other languages like uh, Catalan, Brazilian, Portuguese, you would say, well, you, the terminer is already occupying that there D head and referential type comes from that determiner and then and the noun stays in the noun phrase and stays input. So movement is not possible when you have that determiner. And Longobardi says, well, uh, in those languages that do that, like Catalan or Brazilian, Portuguese, maybe the article is expletive. And he uses the term expletive saying, well, it doesn't provide, it's, it's, we know that the, in this case, the term is not providing referentiality because it's already in the proper noun. Therefore, you just put there because you need to put like a, something there to say, okay, um, 
this is a DP position, but I'm not providing any referential features to it. And he claims, well, there's no semantic difference between one case and the other. Whether you have the terminal or not the terminal doesn't make any difference. It's the same syntax. You have a DP. In some cases, you move the N to D. And in some cases, the D is occupied by the terminal. But uh, there is a semantic difference. And this is something that we want to take advantage of. And this was already pointed out by Brucard in the grammar of Catalan. So let's take a proper name like Noam Chomsky, which you, I'm sure you're all familiar with. <laughs> um, uh, so he, he is the, you know, now the fact that you put the, what we call in Catalan, the personal article, or not to the name of Noam Chomsky's does have a semantic meaning difference. So usually when you write about Noam Chomsky as a linguist, you would write Noam Chomsky without the personal article. So in an article or a paper, I would say Noam Chomsky claims blah, blah, blah. However, if I do use the personal article and Noam Chomsky, I'm adding something there. And I'm adding, that there is a certain type, which I'm trying to make more specific, of familiarity. When I say Noam Chomsky, and I'm saying that I'm friends with Noam Chomsky, or I'm, you know, I'm just saying that there is, I'm, I'm putting and adding a feature of familiarity to Noam Chomsky that is not present when I just say Noam Chomsky. So it's adding something. So it's not completely equivalent to do have, to have the, 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 the personal article or not. So there is a semantic difference. The construction with personal or determinants introduced. And one thing that we want to say is that contrary to Longobardi, or not completely against him, but we're going to say that, that uh, proper nouns introduce a more complex syntax than what Longobardi had in mind when he talked about that. And this is what we, I'm going to address. So, um, so that's this clear. So it's not just, it's, so the question that is expletive, whatever expletive means, which is not very clear in syntax anymore, it's not an expletive in terms of meaning, doing something. And we try to figure out what that is, okay? So let me start with the personal article in Catalan. Remember in Catalan, uh, um, you do use these articles with proper names and only with proper names of persons and is on, for those who are interested in historical why it came about, is the same evolution, is the same origin of the word don, dom in Portuguese and in Spanish, which comes from dominus. So that's why only that in Catalan decided to take the end of dominus and you have on. So one of the interesting properties about these uh, personal articles in Catalan that distinguish them from regular articles in, in regular articles or definite articles in Spanish and in, in, in Catalan themselves, is the fact that it cannot pluralize. So you cannot pluralize a proper name. You can pluralize pronoun So if you're talking about two Peters or all Peters, the Peters that I know, even in English, you can do that, but you cannot do that with a personal article. So that's a very interesting property of personal articles. You cannot pluralize. The second property that uh, that they have that distinguish them to regular articles is the fact that nothing can intervene between the personal article in Catalan and the proper name. So the same Maria or the self Maria, proper beta, it's impossible in with a personal article, but it's possible with the, the, the definite article. Okay, so no pluralization, nothing intervenes between the personal article and the proper noun. And the third one, which is probably obviously you would think is related to all the other ones, is that it cannot have a relative clause. Contrary to definite articles. So uh, the Peter that arrived yesterday is possible, but um, with a personal article, you cannot say uh, the un Peter that arrived yesterday. So there is a quite uh, interesting distinction. I'm not gonna go into, you know, it would take me two hours to go through all the details of our analysis. And uh, we have, uh, in the reference, you have some of the work that we did on this. 
But one of the interesting things is that in some contexts, the personal article and the definite articles can occur in the same phrase. And it is very telling us about what the structure of the personal article is different from the definite article. And the fact is that the personal article is closer to the proper noun than the definite article. So you have the famous John, you could have the personal article and the definite article, but the definite article would be in an external position and the personal article would be closer to the proper noun, the famous and John. So taking on these cases, basically we have proposed that some of the interesting or curious properties of personal articles in Catalan is because they occur, occur, occupy a more internal position in the DP. So there are not only one DP with a noun phrase, there are two phrases, one external one, which is the, where the reference or definite article appears, one internal one, we have used the term classifier. We know that it's not the same as classifiers in other languages. We just wanna, we are looking for a better name, but we are just saying that there is a more internal position which can explain to us why this position, one of the properties it doesn't pluralize and it has nothing can anything, can nothing can inter it's more adjacent to the noun. So that's why you cannot have adjectives to appear between the personal article and the noun. So this is a more, this is what I said that there is a more complex structure in, the, in these constructions with proper names. So you have an external DP and internal, well, and, and that internal ones cannot be occupied, only can be occupied by the personal article in Catalan. It cannot be occupied by a doctor definite article. So things like the famous, the John, the famous, the Mary, it's impossible. So only these ones with this personal article are allowed. So this is what the structure we came up with. Uh, 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 in a way, this is more, I would say cartographic saying that there are two layers of the terminers and determiner when we have proper names, contrary to, contrary or to what, to Longobardia, that's not necessarily contrary to Longobardia. So let's go, let's move to Spanish. So Catalan has that and it's quite attested and we have the personal article. I still haven't said anything about the semantic difference. Let me talk about it later. So in standard Spanish, how proper names work? Standard Spanish, I guess, I don't know, I guess standard Spanish, I don't know, right, you know, pick up whatever you want to call uh, standards. And we're talking here about what Rai and Asale says. As you will see, my Spanish is not standard because I'm influenced by Catalan, I guess. Uh, so in, in standard Spanish, we're supposed, the, the now proper names are supposed to be the same way, no determiners. Except that in some cases, we allow some determiners. So if this is not universal. So you, you do have some determiners. And interestingly, you use it with famous, <laughs> famous women, um, opera singers like uh, Maria Callas, La Callas, uh, Montserrat Caballé, La Caballé. So you find that. And that is interesting because even in English, you cannot do that. You cannot say the Callas or the Caballé. So there is a more restricted system. Even in the standard Spanish, you don't have determiners. There's still something to be said here. Why on earth you have that? And then you have with articles, so the scary men, el poco, el piernas, the long legs, la chata, flat face, la, and some of these, uh, you know, form with adjectives or nouns, apodos in some way. So you do have that. This is the standard personal out. Um, now, in popular languages, in many varieties of Spanish, that paradigm where you don't have determiners with proper nouns, uh, personal nouns, is not true. And you might find them in other varieties, like you have, uh, you can say el Manolo, la Luisa. So you would have, in the, there, is a, there, is a, there is a variability. Um, so you might have Alberto, or you could have, uh, El Alberto. So in the standard one, it seems to be that the appearance of this determiner is a link to something about distinctions or renowns. And also the appearance of the articular is a market of social dialectal variation. That is to say the social, the use of the determiner in some is stigmatized in some areas. 
as you know, socially. Uh, like in Cordova, if you use it, it's not looked at as a standard. But I, I heard that from a uh, person from Cordova. So, I mean, you know, if you, I heard people say it, but it's a certain sociological, uh, lower uh, working class uh, people. So there is these two. So there is. We have to take into account this. 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 The fact that you know it indicates uh, renown, renowned, to be renowned in some cases, like La Cala, La Caballé, and other cases is a social sociological distinction. And then another another ball game is Catalonia because Catalonia because we it's is an interesting contact feature between Catalan and Spanish is the fact that all the Spanish spoken in Catalonia uses a determinant and there is no sociological difference there. Basically, we all use a determiner because you know it's that's incorporated that feature of Catalan in all the people who uh, and the ones who uh, in the Spanish spoken in Catalonia. So you say uh, Luis, and there is no sociological distinction. Now, one interesting thing is that, so that we have these two variables, you can say Luis or Luis, and the only thing that in terms of features distinguish one case and the other is that when you don't use the determiner, it can be plus or minus familiar. I'm not saying that you say Luis is not, it's, it's more formal, it could be also familiar, but definitely when you say a Luis, it's plus familiar. So there's no this variability, So there's a distinction there. Luis could be plus or minus familiar. A Luis is only plus familiar. Um, so this is again a variety. And then, so and, and one thing is that Catalan is is symmetrical, like Brazilian Portuguese. You do it with all proper names, masculines or feminine. But that's not true for all varieties. There are varieties uh, of Peninsular Spanish that do make a distinction between masculine or feminine. So they would not use the article with masculine, but they would use it with feminine. This is found in, in the center and in Extremadura. So the distinction is only found in the feminine. So you say Olga could be plus or minus familiar, but la Olga is only plus familiar. And you might think, well, is this unique? No. When we presented this work in, uh, in various venues and in, in Spain and also with, in Italy, in Italy is also in Italian dialects is also the same. So we have a distinction between masculine or feminine. While masculine is not allowing the, the terminer, feminine does. So there is an asymmetry here and it goes beyond these cases is found also, as I guess said, in many Italian dialects. You say, oh yes, in my dialect happened the same, but only with feminine nouns. It's interesting. So this is a sociological question. How much of the grammatical system is playing a role into this? Well, that's interesting. And finally, we want, I, we want, I want to mention, not finally, but in, in this study, I want to mention this wonderful work by Angela Di Tullio, 2016, which she works on the use of the uh, determiner for proper nouns in in Argentinian Spanish. And in her work, uh, she says, well, proper names with article are possible in Argentinian Spanish. And particularly in these cases of El Adolfo, which refers to former president, and El Diego, which as you probably figure out is referring to Maradona. <laughs> Um, so this this goes back to what we saw in Spanish with La Caballé, what we saw with La Caballé and and uh, she mentions these cases, like uh, an example that she gives in this paper. El Aniceto parado en la Plaza de Mayo mira pasar a la Francisca. Well, can't do it with an Argentinian accent, but <laughs> uh, uh, this is an example. And so she claims, and she, she writes in this study of the use of the article in Argentinian Spanish, the article adds an effective try, uh, an effective trade of an interpersonal nature that of belonging we are now to the circle of people close to the interlocutors. Remember what I mentioned about um, a, a presupposition of familiarity there? Teresa distinguishes herself from by Teresa by referring to the person who it is part of the speaker's environment. So you see how the use of the determiner in one case is 
these are known people at Adolfo El Diego, and in these cases, certain cases of familiarity. So summarize uh, Argentinian and Spanish according to the Tulio 2016. Articles with proper names are reference of social and affective relevance, are reference of the environment of the interlocutors, and are, they also are playing a sociolectal marker or more dialectal. So it has three. So we have two systems. Um, I'm just presenting the data, but we have two systems in the use of the determiner. And I think Brazilian Portuguese, from what I understand, is, is symmetric. I don't think the Brazilian Portuguese makes a distinction between masculine or feminine. But we do have that in some varieties and in Italian dialects. So we have a symmetric system, like Brazilian Portuguese, like Spanish, like uh, Spanish in Catalonia, like Argentinian in the popular languages, where you have uh, the use of the, the terminal with masculine or feminine. So, and that system where you have the determiner is plus familiar. When you don't have the determiner, it can be plus or minus familiar. And then you have the asymmetric system in which uh, basically it, this is only happening in the feminine, but not in the masculine. And this is what we found in the standard Spanish with la cala, la caballe, and in peninsular Spanish in some varieties that make a distinction between. So going back to the complex uh, syntactic structure that I um, was working on before, um, basically where we're saying is, in according to what we saw with the Tulio, is that when we add the determiner, there is Juan plus a presupposition, an acknowledgement of familiarity. The article indicates that there is an, and we are translated that in our syntax in the following way. We're gonna say that there is an empty category, this is our analysis, between, that appears between the determiner. So the determiner, when you say El Juan, is introduced in a sort of an empty category. Uh, we're not sure about how to call that, but we'll say the empty category is the equivalent of an empty of a personal relation classifier. Remember what I said about Catalan? So we are going in that direction, but in this case, in, in, in this data, we are saying that is we are introducing a sort of an empty classifier here. So, and I try to later on to, to motivate why we have this extra projection there. So the meaning difference between is introduced not by the determiner, because with that probably we are agreeing with Longobardi that determiner is not the one introducing that, but what is introducing that extra meaning possibility is uh, the classifier, okay? So the, the difference in familiarity and all that is expressed by that classifier. How can we uh, assume what is that? Well, you could say when you say la calas, maybe that thing you really are saying la, and then that empty thing, which would say unica, prima donna, good, whatever. On the same with El Diego, you say el, you have this classifier, beloved, or Diego. So you have this empty thing that is giving do this um, meaning different, okay. And uh, in the same with the feminine, so la Olga would be la, um, and this empty thing would close our Olga, that would be different. So this is, so uh, yeah. So that the, it would be introducing these empty classifiers in all these examples with the Spanish in Catalonia and also with Argentinian Spanish and then uh, introducing that extra layer. So in this respect, it's similar to what we had said for Catalan before. So why do we have the determiners? Because by introducing the, the classifier, don or n, we are assuming that um, by impose, imposing this extra category that's introducing that meaning, uh, then the, this is blocking, this is the idea behind it, this is blocking the movement of the, of the, of the noun to the determiner head, and therefore that's why you need the article. So the need of the article is because the proper name is not able to move to the D head. So this is also a, a, a counter example to that is the fact that a don, which is similar in many respects to, to what we have here, it's also blocking the movement of the noun in Don Luis. So that's the idea. And also found with titles. So el Presidente Obama, you don't say Presidente Obama, you have to say the determiner. The reason is the Obama is not appearing 
uh, needs the article is because anytime, so the reason why you need a determiner with this cl empty classifier is because the same reason when you have a title like Presidente, you need to have the determiner. So classifiers requires the determiner, Presidente requires the determiner. You, can say, you cannot say Presidente Obama, you have to say El Presidente Obama. So anytime you introduce that empty thing, you have to put the determiner. Lo mismo con el señor Esteban, okay? Which is very interesting, particularly I'm curious because exactly in this respect, English is very interesting because you cannot say the President Obama in English, you have to say President Obama. So the same way that in English you cannot say uh, the John, you cannot say the President Obama. So it has to be a relation between both things. So there is this thing that is blocking uh, the movement of the noun phrase, that's why you, express. So anytime you have this empty classifier there, I'm calling classifier, we are still thinking about how to call that empty thing, but anytime you put that thing there, you have to put a determinant. That's the logic of this idea. And, and the idea of putting empty things there, okay, so um, you might be a skeptical of proposing empty things, but we know in the study of proper names beyond nouns, beyond proper names, and the proper names that we have to you have to assume that there are empty things in some proper names. I'm uh, not a person, but other things. So in order to just to finalize, because I think I'm taking too much time. Um, uh, so to finalize the, why do we have to have empty things with proper names, not only of person, but other things? Well, there is a very interesting argument for that. The argument is as follows. There is a very interesting more phonological uh, property of Spanish. That is that feminine nouns that start with a stress a, ah, feminine nouns with a stress a ah, do not take the feminine article, they take the masculine. So a feminine noun like hunger, la hambre, you say el hambre. The eagle, you say, uh, just feminine, you say el águila. However, it's only when it's adjacent to the noun. In the moment that you put something between the determiner and the noun, then that does not apply with, it does not apply with adjectives. So it, it applies with Aguila noun because of a feminine noun, but if you say alta, which is an adjective and it's feminine, you don't apply that. You say el, la alta montaña, you don't say el alta montaña. So we know that this rule is sensitive to adjacency of the determiner with the noun. If it's feminine and it starts with a stress R. Huh? But there are two very, very uh, curious counter examples. And one is la A y la H. So you would expect that because A is a stress or H, which is the other, another letter, the letter H, you would expect that you would have to apply that rule and you would have to say el H y el A because you have a stress A, it's feminine. Therefore, you would have to have them the apply, but you don't. Why don't we apply it? Well, here is one explanation is to say that what you have there is an empty noun. So you, when you say la H, you really are saying the letter H. And because it's not adjacent la to H, that's why the, the morphophonological rule that we had seen before does not apply. But the same la A. La A could be, in some people's la A, or here in New York, el A means the train A. If I say el A, it's perfectly fine, it means the train A. But in some people, in, in Cuba, in La Habana, would say la A would be the street A. And that rule does not apply because you have an empty thing there, which you are putting in that position of, classifier. So you would have sort of a, you would have sort of a, a, of a, over, of a, a capital letter. So that translates to proper names as well. The reason it doesn't apply to proper names is starting with A, which are feminine. You don't say El Angela. You say La Angela. And you say uh, someone is called El Alvarez. If it's, it's feminine, you don't say la, you don't say El Alvarez because it's feminine. You say La Alvarez. So we have to assume that there is an empty thing there. The same. So the fact that you're not applying that more phonological rule is due to the fact that we have this extra structure containing empty things. So the our idea of having empty things between the determiner and the proper noun doesn't seem so crazy. That's what you might think. Uh, and also, I'm not going to go into details. This is a very complex, and it's been worked by many people. I think, and 
and uh, I'm and I'm gonna, but with proper names, particularly Matushansky and, and Andres have also has worked on these issues of, of proper names a lot. And I know I'm glossing over all these details, but basically you know that you say Al Argentina, you probably could think that there is an empty thing called the Republica. Okay. I mean, there is many questions here. Or when you say the river Ama El Rio Amazonas, you say El Amazonas, you really say in a classifier empty thing Amazonas. Basically, what I'm giving you here is to say, okay, it's not that for far crazy to think that there are some empty things when you say a proper name without a terminal. Only that it's not necessarily translatable into overt things like Rio, Islas, Las Malvinas, etc. And finally, but I think I'm going to skip that because it's probably more controversial that this could be translated into other nouns. And I'm just going to conclude because this last thing is just very um, sort of an, an interesting thing, but we are still trying to solve some issues with with uh, the last thing is about the fact when you say esta es la solución, uh, you stress the determiner. One of the interesting properties of that construction, this is the solution, is that in Spanish it doesn't allow to be modified and it doesn't allow to be relative positive. When you say esta es la solución, you cannot sort of, you cannot say in Spanish esta es la solución, esta es la solución que proponemos, esta es la mejor solución. It can only be a bare noun. That's a very interesting thing. When you stress the clitic, this is the solution. It can only be a bare noun, and I leave it at that. Uh, so basically, um, what this work, parametric study of Catalan, Spanish, varieties, and probably extendable to Brazilian Portuguese, I'm curious to know what it is, is that the idea that the, they definitely proper nouns are not as boring as one might think. They have a more complex structure. And it, it, there is this empty, this middle category, which I call classifier. Don't take that word classifier seriously. We could call it whatever you want. Something is there. Um, and uh, we have a more, and we saw that that classifier is less grammaticalized in Brazil, in, 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 um, in Catalan with that personal article. That's our take on that. And we saw some symmetric symptoms, some asymmetric symptoms. And um, I think that to wrap up, this is a, so about the third question about how to do microparametric syntax. Well, so you see how it is <laughs> done by going in detail, uh, language properties, and it's very hard to, and you always find new things. And it just show how intricate and complex and beautiful languages are. Okay, and then I'm gonna stop at that. So I'm gonna stop sharing. So uh, I think I, I leave it to Sonia to take the, to, to say, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was a very interesting talk dealing with very um, interesting points and so and topics and I have um, some questions here so I'll, I'll try to see if I can make all of them. So actually I have questions that related to the first part about uh, you know topic in Brazilian Portuguese and the sec the, and the, also to the second uh, part. So the first question that I have here is um, is there any historical similarity between Brazilian Portuguese agreeing topics and, and English um, experiencers, you know, the former dative English experiences in something like I like you as a consequence of dative case, you know, in, like, like in Spanish, me gusta, you know. Uh, that's, that's an interesting thing because uh, I don't know the answer, but it's it's an interesting analogy with uh, because we know that the history of English there is a change in psychological verbs. So it 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 is true that this this question is pointed out to something very interesting that it used to be dative, so in, mm -hmm. older it used to be more like Spanish or like, a, and it became more of a, no, I haven't explored it, um, but it's a very interesting. Uh, idea and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know it's I haven't yeah. but it, it it's probably my guess is that there are certain points of connection but not all of them 
Mm -hmm. As you know, as there we're talking about, I mean, this is when microparametric syntax becomes able, you know, there are some things that are connected, but then there are other variables that are in the middle there that cannot, that, that, that can, what I, I noticed doing this work is that there's no free, uh, there's no free variation. You, you look good enough, you see that there is always something that is not the same in the other variety. There's mm -hmm. something different in this and that. So when you say, when people say this is a change, but, uh, some, but yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and, and, but I don't know, it's a good suggestion. Okay. Now, another question related to, to that is, how do we explain the disappearance of para in Brazilian Portuguese cases where the dative head is known? Because you said we have a dative head that would be the, the third person, lié, right? And, but then you, together with this disappearance of lié, you have the, we don't have para in these constructions. You don't have Assuming para. that para is a dative marker, like a uh, in Spanish, right? So in this construction, you, you do have para or not. I'm not clear. I mean, I mean, in construction, uh, not, I mean, I think the, <laughs> I mean, I think construction is like, uh, uh, I keep it fault of sort. I'll keep it. Oh, oh um, that I leave it to Mary <laughs> But, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, um, I, I mean, that's an interesting, that we know, and that has been studied by Sayes, and Torres and many people working on datives is how mm -hmm. Brazilian Portuguese over the years have been getting rid of the ah uh, and using more para. But it's interesting that in this case for what this question is asking is the opposite. Uh, I don't know, but that's something that I- In fact, I, we can say para equipe photo search, but then I think it's uh, different from a equipe photo search, I mean. Some, uh, some, okay. different. But, but also related to that is um, you say that you would have an empty clitic that there in this construction, but it has to be a, a, a dative empty, empty clitic, right? right? So would we, because you know, maybe the accusative clitics are not no clitics. So do we need to do make this distinction, you think? All these constructions um, in Spanish are expressed by dative. Mm -hmm. uh, it is pretty much all the examples, every single topic subject constructions, you could use the dative. And I remember going through all these examples and uh, with uh, Gyros and Naves and uh, Andrade mm -hmm. and all these examples I could immediately make a dative. So my guess is that it's a dative clitic, yes. Mm -hmm. I, but I, I'm saying we, it's like, you know, we are entering into the world of empty things and people are as, as you know, uh, we need empty things in syntax anyway. So mm -hmm. if we have empty morphemes, why shouldn't we have, I mean, it's something something on a bus track, but the fact that we have a quite a parallel between all these Examples of topic subjects that are using the dative in Spanish. That I think that why not? Yeah, it, but it's dative. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned the work by Cida Torres and, and uh, Eloisa Salles because they also talk about the disappearance of lié, the applicative. Right. Head, and, you know, yeah. maybe. No, that, yes, that, that's totally linked to the disappearance of this uh, lié in the. Mm -hmm. Great. Now there's another question which is related to T, to, to the head T. If the DP agrees with T, if the DP, I mean, is the DP attracted by the an EPP feature that is not uh, related to agree uh, to go to the dative phrase projection? And then why would this EPP feature be so selective? So selective? Oh, oh, yeah, because well, a part whole DP is mandatory in these sentences. What this is the um, that that brings me to the question of uh, of uh, inalienable construction, inalienable dative constructions in languages, which we find in in you know it's very robust in all the Romance languages, which you so mm -hmm. you have you know you you have these 
elements that could be part of the DP and part inside the DP, but in some cases, what, what is called, in other words, what in other languages is called processor racing, right? Mm -hmm. We know that that construction exists. So there are mm -hmm. things that move out of the processor construction and then they move out. And what I'm, we are saying here is just, uh, well, Brazilian Portuguese not, now, I mean, there are the, twin, I mean, I, I was precisely reading a paper by Deal about this, where she looks at all the languages that where all these has been proposed. And there are different types of, of data, uh, processor raisings. But uh, technically speaking, there are different ways in which you can implement that by idea that, you know, you, there is something formal attracting that dative position that contains the empty thing. And we know that the, in some languages, it has some consequences like affectedness. So I assume that when you say quebró o pneu do Hamilton versus o Hamilton quebró o pneu, that there is more of an affectedness effect there. So we know, and, and it's like using the data in Spanish, uh, se rompió la, la rueda del coche de Hamilton, or uh, Hamilton se le rompió la rueda del coche. Mm -hmm. so we do have that. There is some formal feature there, but apparently it's mm -hmm. not sufficient. So basically what we would say is that there is a, a dative racing in Brazilian Portuguese, mm -hmm. believe it or not, and then because it's not sufficient to be raised there because it creates some effect in this condition, then we have to move it to, to something that is the TP. So it goes to the spec TP. To spec. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. Uh, now I'm, I'll move to, there's another one more question. There are some more questions on the second part. So I'll try, let's see if we can do all of them. So the first one is um, a comment that in some varieties of Iberian Spanish, for example, Asturian, the addition of la or el occurs in, a, in very casual cases with a derogatory flavor. Noé vino, la noé vino. Yeah, well, um, yes, uh, it's, it's true that there is, that goes into, as, as we have proposed that empty thing there, we are not giving it a definite semantic, so the semantic contents of that element so whenever you add some semantic content, like we saw that la caballé or la, la caballé or la, what was it? You, you have, or el Diego or el, uh, el, el, el Diego is not said in a derogative way, obviously. <laughs> so that means that the varieties might change in, in how much, how, what semantic content they give to that classifier thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And therefore, but if you add some meaning because you say la neus or la neus, so that, that derogative thing is there. The interesting mm -hmm. thing is if, if that derog derogative tone can be used with similarly for the masculine than with the feminine. Mm -hmm. Because as we say, there is an asymmetry. It's mm -hmm. all sociological, namely, you know, living in a more much oriented society or it's just, there is something about the grammatical thing. I think there is a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Because it's also true that probably one factor that plays a role here with the feminine is that the feminine, in, as in the morphological system of these languages, at least in Spanish, has a different status, morphology, mm -hmm. as more marked gender than the masculine. Mm -hmm. um, and it also explains why English, and, and probably, and this is pure speculation, but it's interesting that English doesn't do it at all. Mm -hmm. Even for the colors that you don't do it. And one difference mm -hmm. between English and these languages that you can eventually do it is that it has no grammatical gender system. Mm -hmm. well, that, would, that excludes English for this whole business because it has no grammatical gender system. So mm -hmm. having grammatical gender system seems to be a condition for having this sort of the terminary used with the article. I mean, I might be wrong. German does it, so proper names do use and has a gender system. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So the, our theory leaves for things to be there. Not only it could be derogatory information, it could be admiring information, or it could be just classified ah, things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, there's another. Uh, kind of comment or question uh, related to, to this. Um, according to Picayo, class encodes extra linguistic information into the syntax. Would you say that this is the case with the personal determiner adding a plus familiar feature into the syntax? 
And if so, what are your thoughts on that kind of extra linguistic features added into syntax, which is more or less what you were commenting now? Yeah, well, in that sense, yeah. That, um, so first of all, that we are saying that the terminary is not introduced, introducing the classifier phrase, but that semantic information is in the classifier phrase. So it's, it's adding it in the middle. And uh, I think that I wouldn't, uh, yeah. Uh, so what we are doing is syntax design, syntacticizing semantic information. So bringing some pragmatic factors into the syntax. Um, I'm very sympathetic with that. Yeah, is to say uh, somehow languages have to have a different syntax for bringing in into some other semantic information. And I think that that's, that's 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 I'm, I for me it's a welcome result yes the question is that in some languages some semantic information gets grammaticalized in some languages it doesn't get grammaticalized and in these languages you you do have that determiner and somehow in, involves this and because as I said before you could have these um, you can have a the, the difference, the asymmetry is that when you put the determiner, you are adding something, but you don't, when you don't have the determiner, for instance, in, in proper name could be still familiar when you say John, but mm -hmm. if you say the John, definitely you are adding something. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I, I'm happy with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some other questions which are more or less less touch what you have um, discussed now. So maybe I'll just uh, leave them. And then there's a final question, uh, which is similarly, why would, would empty, no. Um, why would empty categories affect PF phenomena always? Sometimes the assumption is that, uh, is that empty elements do not obstruct PF adjacency. Um. Yeah, so this approach is basically not going in the line of let's take the approach of one approach, one, uh, one uh, contraction. That's right. And it, one of the explanations that uh, was say that the reason why you have one uh, connection is because a big pro uh, uh, phonological is not there and therefore you could do this sort of thing. So, um, well, I would say that those things have to be rethought and that there might be some, we are bringing into, into the possibility that um, what is important for phonology is, in, is the things to be phonologically adjacent, the things that are, Things could be phonologically adjacent, but not syntactically adjacent. And when those two things are different, then you'd have a different effect. So mm -hmm. let me give you an example of, of this sort of thing. In the case of clitics, you know, I mean, I, and there is a very interesting proposal by Kang, which, you know, clitics are things that seem to be together all the time. You know, they, they are together one to another. But in, in, in creating his monograph said, well, two clitics that are phonologically adjacent, not necessarily translate into syntactically adjacent. Mm -hmm. And it could be that even if they are phonologically adjacent, they could be in the same head, in the same head, but they could be phonologically adjacent, but be in different he heads. Mm -hmm. And when they are in different heads, he shows that you have a different effect. Mm -hmm. So being phonologically adjacent and syntactically adjacent is not the same. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we are saying, well, uh, these things that have this empty thing, they are syntactically no adjacent. Therefore, the phonology is taking into account that. But yes, uh, the, the common is right. This approach would not be compatible with the Peseski idea that big pro uh, mm -hmm. doesn't block uh, phonological process. And I'm pretty happy with that. I think that there are some theories that, yeah. that say that that <laughs> theory was not. So basically what he had is that pro was moving somewhere else on uh, the side, I don't know. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and it's a very challenging question too, because, you know, in the interface, but I, I wanna, 
I don't like, I don't want to have such a blind, I think phonology has to be re reading whatever the syntactic structure is. Mm -hmm. And the syntactic structure, contrary to appearances, something me look that they are together. And in reality, and this is going in the same direction, even if they are syntactic, they, are, they look, they are, the, the fact that phonologic adjacency is syntactic adjacency is wrong. Mm -hmm. That's what I, my claim would be. Great. Well, yeah. there are a few other questions, but I think um, most of the things they are, they are asking you have touched. And then maybe, I don't know, they can ask you, send you an email. And yes, they can ask me an email. Yeah. So, yeah, great, because now we don't have much more time. Yeah. So I would like to, to thank you to Paco once more, as well as the public and their interesting and challenging questions. No, and no. I hope uh, everybody will continue to watch and participate in the lives promoted by Abralin, as this is a great way of staying tuned with what goes on in linguistics in this such tur turbulent, turbulent times like this. Yes. Now, would you like to say some final words before we end oh, well, this? I would like to thank you for inviting me. This has been a very interesting, exciting experience. And I think it, 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 it has its downsides, the fact that we are living in these times, but also it has opened the possibility of having all these researchers to talk to people across uh, the continents and in Brazil and give us a chance to express, to, 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 to talk about our ideas and also to discuss them. Uh, I mean, it's too bad that Abralin is not happening in Brazil, but the <laughs> fact that, you know, I'm I usually in New York and you are in Sao Paulo, I assume, or in whatever, the fact that we can do this here um, uh, a lot, uh, with this method, I think it has an advantage, you know, that I can talk to yes. you. Yes, definitely. Thank, thank you, Sonia, for, for your presentation. Thank you. That was a great talk. I'm, I'm sure everybody had a very um, great time by participating. And thank you very much for everything. If you have any questions, please send me an email.